Good morning. Uh, my name is Steve McKetton. I'm the Corporate Technical Trainer here at April Air. Thank you for taking the time out of your day for this morning's webinar on steam humidifiers. Uh, this is a Nate class. Um, so when you registered, um, more than likely you put in your Nate uh, information. Um, so you'll be all set to go. Um, if you don't think you did, you're more than welcome to put that in the comments using the GoToWebinar tool and we'll, we can cross match that as well. All right, we've got a lot of people uh, listening in this morning, which is great, um, but I'm gonna move kind of quickly to try and get this all in in about 50 minutes. So I may not have time for any actual questions, but I will do my best to answer them as quickly as I can this week after this webinar. So it is a Nate class. So let's start out with some basics first. Getting good evaporation is a very, very simple concept. We need three things. We need water, airflow, and heat. We combine those three things in the right proportions. We're going to get good evaporation. We're going to be able to introduce humidity into the home's air. I know it seems maybe oversimplified, but when you're looking at an application, you know, is this is this going to be a, you know, this way I'm thinking of installing this steam humidifier, is this going to work? You just want to make sure you're going to have good airflow, sufficient airflow. You're going to have sufficient water. And of course, you've got the electrical set up, so you're generating the heat you need. Troubleshooting is really, in most cases, no more difficult than which of those things are we missing. So our steam humidifiers use electricity to heat water to boiling and then into steam. The steam then travels down a steam tube and it either gets introduced into the HVAC ductwork with the HVAC blower absorbing the steam, you know, using uh, moving air to absorb the steam and then disperse that humidified air throughout the home. Or towards the end of the webinar, we'll talk about a fan pack that we have uh, that gets installed separate from the HVAC system and has its own small fan inside of it to accomplish the same thing. Conceptually, what we're doing when we boil the water into steam and then introduce it into the home is we're adding absolute humidity. We're adding grains of moisture, molecules of water. And as we do that, we will increase the relative humidity of the home to make it uh, better for the occupant's comfort and health, as well as any wood furnishings, musical instruments, that kind of thing inside the home. The need for humidification is going to be present in any home that you're heating. Outside air leaks in, you warm that air up, that depresses the relative humidity. We'll talk about why that is. So you need to have a humidifier to improve the relative humidity in the home. But that's not to say that there aren't other times when you need a humidifier. The desert southwest needs humidification typically year round even when you're running an air conditioner. Any place that's at a high altitude like Denver, same deal, you're gonna need humidification throughout the year, not because it's particularly cold, but because it's so dry. So let's walk through these concepts a little bit. So relative humidity incorporates both the amount of humidity in the air, the absolute humidity, as well as the temperature of that air. And that's because the temperature of the air affects how much moisture the air can hold. The warmer the air is, the more moisture it can hold. The colder the air is, the less moisture it can hold. And that's what these two cylinders are illustrating. The cylinder on the left, we're at 30 degrees Fahrenheit. We have 12 grains of moisture, so that's the absolute humidity, that's how much moisture is in the air, and that works out to a relative humidity of 50%. If we just heat that air from 30 degrees to 70 degrees, doesn't matter how we heat it, radiant heat, oil furnace, heat pump, geothermal heat pump, baseboard electric heat, 
pellet stove, doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. It's heating the air. By heating the air, in this example, 40 degrees, that warmer air can hold a lot more moisture. The height of the cylinder has increased to represent that. We haven't removed or added any moisture. Air going through a furnace does not destroy the water, doesn't burn the water up. It's the same amount of moisture, 12 grains in both cases. But because the air is warmer, it can hold more moisture. We haven't added any moisture, so how full that cylinder is of moisture has decreased. The relative humidity of that air at 70 degrees has decreased. In these examples, we've gone from 50% at 30 degrees Fahrenheit and 12 grains to 12% at 70 degrees and 12 grains. So how do we fix that? We have to add moisture. We have to add absolute humidity. So we started out at 50% and 30 degrees and 12 grains of moisture. We heated that air at 70 degrees Fahrenheit. The relative humidity dropped. The grains of moisture stayed the same. We add moisture. In this case, we get up to 64 grains of moisture, and that gets us back up to that 50% relative humidity. Okay, so that's what the humidifier does. There is an actual science to this. I want to show you the calculations based on it, and I'll show you we've already done all the work for you in our very simple tables that I'm sure you've seen throughout our literature. But here are the calculations. This is, this is how you calculate the humidity requirements. Um, this is right out of ASHRAE. So let's say you've got a 3,000 square foot house with eight foot ceilings. That's 24,000 cubic feet. That's the volume of the house. And a quick glance at the lookup table tells us that at standard conditions, that's gonna be 1,778 pounds of air. If we wanted to raise the relative humidity of that air from 12% to 50%, you'd need to add 52 grains of moisture per pound of air. So 1778 times 52 equals a little more than 92,000 grains. 92,000 grains divided by 7,000 is a little bit more than 13 pints. We assume it's a tight home at half an air change per hour. We have to add half that amount every hour. We have to do that every single hour. So that's 154 pints per day at eight pints to a gallon. That's 19.8 gallons per day. And that's once everything is in equilibrium. If everything in the house is dry, the air is at 18%. That means that the, the wood, wood floors, the cabinetry, drywall, everything is also quite dry. So you'd have to add more moisture than that to catch up at the beginning. But once you're at an equilibrium at a steady state, you would expect every day to have to add a little bit less than 20 gallons per day in this example. But you don't have to do the math because we have a table for you. So same thing, 3,000 square feet, eight foot ceilings, or 1,000 square feet with eight foot ceilings, tight construction, average construction, loose construction, you just find where you are in the table and that's how many gallons per day you have to add. Makes it very simple, very straightforward. Steam humidifiers are great for a wide range of applications. The real beauty of the steam humidifier is we completely control the water, the airflow, the heat. We're making the blower run with our automatic humidistat. That's the blower activation feature. We are introducing electricity to boil the water. That's the heat and the moisture. So we're not dependent on a furnace running or the heat pump running or having hot enough water going to the humidifier, for examples. Let's get into a little bit of the nuts and bolts here. So we just talked about how much humidity we have to add. Let's, off, let's figure out how much humidity we're gonna be able to produce with the steam humidifier. The steam humidifier is designed to be very flexible. You have three voltages that it'll run at. 120 volts, 208, and 240 volts AC. 
ideally you would always supply it with 240 volts AC. That's where you're going to really get a great deal of humidity being generated. Uh, in many commercial applications, you only have 208 available, so 208's on this table as well. If you're swapping out another company's steam humidifier that failed miserably, um, you can certainly run ours at 120. It will work fine but the evaporation rate, of course, decreases because you're putting less voltage into the canister, less aggressive boil. You're running your stove at low instead of high. Also, because we know sometimes we don't have all the electricity available at the circuit breaker box that we'd like, we offer you two maximum currents, 11 and a half amps and 16 amps. And you just pick that based on what you have available at your breakers. So at maximum voltage and maximum amperage, 240 volts, 16 amps, that's in the lower right-hand corner or number six on this little graphic, we're gonna produce 34.6 gallons per day. That is a lot of humidity. And that's where I think it's worthwhile taking the time and the extra expense to get this supplied with 240. I think the consumer ultimately is going to be happiest with those results. But um, if you've done the calculations and you don't need that much humidity, certainly a lower voltage would be fine. Uh, but notice when you get down to 120 volts, even at 16 amps, you're down to 16 gallons per day. So just be aware of that. The voltage and the current, volts times, volts times amps equals watts, that's how we're boiling the water. So just keep that in mind when you're picking an application. Another way to think about this is think about, based on the voltage and the current, how big a house can I humidify? Tight house, 240 volts, 16 amps, 48,000 cubic feet. That's a 6,000 square foot house with eight foot ceilings. Drop that same house, still tight, 120 volt, 16 amps. Now we're only humidifying 28,000 cubic feet. So that helps illustrate the difference just based on voltage selection. All right, let's look inside. Inside the cabinet, we have a canister. And inside that canister, you can see the cross section here. It's a plastic canister and you have two electrodes that are submerged into the water. At the top, you're going to hook up two electrode wires. We're gonna send electricity into those electrodes. We need the minerals in the water in order for the water to be conductive so the electricity moves from one electrode to the other. The more minerals, the more conductive the water it is. So first and foremost, never ever, ever use reverse osmosis water. You may know that as RO water or distilled water. We don't want that. The unit's not drawing any amps and you just installed it, first thing a tech support's gonna ask you is, let's talk about the water supply. We want the regular old cold potable water. If you have a water softener, that's even better. Cold softened water because of the sodium chloride that's in the water softener gives us very, very conductive water. As far as how conductive or how hard water can we work with, we can work with anything from three to 36 grains of hardness. That pretty much covers us everywhere. Think of it this way. If you get your water from an aquifer, then you're gonna have water that is hard enough. If you get your water from a reservoir, for example, out west, maybe you get your water from a reservoir that fills with rivers that come from the mountains, snowpack. Snow melts, fills the reservoir. That water has not had a lot of chance to pick up minerals. It will typically be softer. It may be, it may be um, still hard enough, maybe enough minerals in it, but that would, be, that would be the only thing you need to check. And this is not a house by house thing. Um, you know, most people will know, you know, in this neighborhood, everybody has a water softener 
or in this neighborhood, everybody's got really hard water or whatever. Um, there are water connectivity meters that you can buy. They're very reasonably priced. Um, we can sure help you with some of those if that's something you want to do, uh, just so you know. But in general, you know, if you have water softeners in the neighborhood, you know that water is going to be plenty hard. Basically, it's the more minerals, the more conductive, the faster it boils. The fewer minerals, the less conductive, the longer it takes to boil. That's all. That's the only difference. Be very, very, very careful with picking a water filter. Water filters a lot of times will do far more harm than good, far more harm than good. Um, many people select a water filter designed for ice makers. They say, oh, this has got to be good for this. The problem is people like clear ice cubes. And so a lot of those water filters for ice makers actually have some chemical adjuncts in them that dissolve into the water. So we do not want that. Um, if you feel the need to put in a, a turbidity filter or a particulate filter, that's fine, but just make sure that all it has is mesh filtration inside of it. We don't want any chemical additives at all. The electrical side of it is very, very simple. The circuit board's got a lot going on there, but we don't care. You're gonna figure out what voltage you have available. Again, 240 volt is ideal. Many commercial applications you only have 208. If 120 is all you have and you've done the sizing or you've had tech support help you with the sizing, that's okay too, just do that first. So 240 volt, 208 volt, 120 volt, you see there's some lugs up there to attach that to. The transformer is a multi-tap transformer. So you wanna make sure that that tap on the transformer is set to match your voltage. If it's set up for 240 volt and you're actually supplying with 120, there's not gonna be 24 volts coming out of the transformer. It's only gonna be 12 volts coming out of the transformer. So if your water valve's not opening and it's a brand new installation, that's the first place tech support's gonna go is, is help me understand what, what electrical supply you have, okay? Did you move the, the jumper wire? Very simple, very straightforward. We're happy to help you with that. What current do you have available? Do you have a, a 25 amp or a 20 amp circuit breaker available? That'll dictate if you want 16 amps as your maximum or 11 and a half amps as your maximum. There's no reason not to pick 16, um, you know, um, if your circuit breaker can handle it. Next, you want to hook up the control. What's going to tell the steam humidifier to operate? Either our automatic digital humidity control, the Model 62, or some other thermostat that has IAQ abilities or a humidistat. Even a building automation system would work fine. We just need a dry contact to tell it to run. And then if you're using our fan pack, there's a place for power to be output. And that is it. It's as simple as that. Um, the, the wiring is very simple, very straightforward. As we're filling with water and boiling the water away to make steam, it's pure steam, pure water that leaves the canister. So the minerals and sediment and tannins and all the things that were in the water are left behind. Now the minerals make it more conductive, which is great. But at some point, it can become too conductive. It, it fills with water. There's so many minerals already dissolved into the canister that it very quickly hits that maximum current level, the 11 and a half amps or the 16 amps that you selected previously. In that case, the canister is going to drain. It's going to flush that water out. There's a lot of smarts built into it. This is one of the smarts. When it's draining that water out, it's also going to be injecting cold water in. So it's, it's running the drain valve and the fill valve at the same time. That helps break up any accumulated sediment that might plug the drain or slow the drain down. It also helps to temper the water. Remember, this water could have just been boiling. So by injecting cold water into that drain stream, we can make sure that that water is not going to be any hotter than 140 degrees. That's important because no one's going to scald themselves, but also it means that you don't have to purchase any special high temperature rated products in your drain line. 
You can use standard plumbing PVC designed to handle up to 140 degrees. You can use a good quality standard condensate pump. You don't have to go to a much more expensive condensate pump designed for hot water. A good quality condensate pump is designed to handle 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Here's the canister. This is actually a view flipped upside down, so you're looking at the bottom of the canister. There's an O-ring to function as a seal, so we get a good tight seal, no dribbling. And then the drain plug. Remember, this is the bottom, so we're looking at it from the bottom. You can see that drain plug slides in, and the slots for the drain plug actually sit up quite high. They're quite long, and so that allows it to be able to drain just fine, even with a fair amount of sediment built up in the bottom. When you replace the canister, of course, just like replacing the oil filter in your car, you want to make sure you get all of that O-ring off. And it's a good idea to wet it before you seat it. That's going to give you a good tight seal. Every new canister comes with a drain plug and a brand new O-ring. We've made them red so they're easier to see. If they happen to, when you pull the canister out, if they're stuck inside the drain valve uh, seat, seat um, you can see it in there and fish it out. We offer two canisters, the model 80, 80, that's our standard canister, and that's going to work with most of the water in the continental United States. We also offer an 80LC, LC for low conductivity. Um, that's going to be used in parts of the country where you have naturally soft water, not, not mechanically softened water with the water softener, but naturally soft water. When I was talking about water that comes from a reservoir, that would be typically naturally soft water, low conductivity, low mineral content. Um, you don't have to buy a special steam humidifier. The canisters are just swappable. So if you purchased a model 800 that came with the standard canister and you realize I, I need low conductivity, you just pick up an 80LC canister. It fits in the same exact unit. No changes required other than the different canister. The difference is the LC canister has larger electrodes and they're closer together to compensate for that lower conductivity. Canister replacement is very, very simple. Hit the on off switch at the unit. That's going to allow it to open the drain valve because you haven't killed power at the circuit breaker. It still has power, so it'll drain out. That's good because the next thing you're going to do is eventually take the canister out. You want it to be not have a lot of soupy water inside of it, so let it drain. Once it's drained, open the unit up. Just one screw holds that cover on. Remove the two electrode wires. Those are the black ones. And the one water probe level wire, that's the yellow one. Loosen your hose clamps. Take out the canister. Throw away that canister. There's no need to wash anything, clean anything. All the minerals were contained inside that canister. Throw it away. Make sure the O-ring from the old canister is out. Put in the new canister with the new O-ring. There should be enough water in the drain valve uh, cup to wet that O-ring just fine. Get that seated. Put your electrode wires back on, your water level sensor wire back on. Tighten down the, um, the hose clamps, and you should be perfectly fine. It literally takes less time to do it than it took me to explain it. The longest part is the drain. Depending on you know how much uh, mineral deposits you have, you might have to wait a little bit longer for it to drain out. That's all. There's not a lot of guesswork as to what's going on. We've got some LEDs on the front that help you understand what's going on with the steam humidifier. Let's just run down those quickly. The top, you only have one button, the on-off button. When you push the on-off button to turn the unit on, the green light lights up, telling you you've got power, it's just ready to go. Eventually, you should get a call for humidification. So the third light, the steam light, will light up, indicating that there's a demand for steam. If the canister is empty, the fill light will light up, telling you that it'll light green. 
until it fills up and then of course it's making steam and so normal operation would be steam light lights up canister fills steam is made and boils away fill light lights up again to fill and that just process repeats and repeats and repeats until the humidistat satisfies the call for humidity and the steam light goes out waiting for the relative humidity to drop in that process to repeat eventually the unit will decide it's time to drain and so the drain light would come on to drain that water away and then we go back to fill and steam fill and steam fill and steam eventually um, the unit will determine that that canister's electrode um, is either covered with mineral deposits and isn't getting good conductivity anymore or that the electrode um, has just simply failed you know depending on if you have hard water or soft water the electrode will either corrode or get covered in mineral deposits doesn't matter six of one half a dozen of the other the canister will determine when that uh, when, when the um, the electrodes are need to be you know are, are used up and the canister needs to be replaced so red service co light comes on flashing it's still making steam it's just letting you know I'm not making steam as well as I did when I was brand new so next couple weeks schedule a site visit to replace that canister out get the new canister in and you should be good to go um, in a typical residential application one canister should last one heating season but there's a lot of variability there um, these get used oftentimes in very large homes with a lot of woodwork and so they run a lot in that case they're going to be need they're going to be replaced more frequently it just depends on how much they run and how hard how hard the water is how many minerals are in that water you may um, happen to stumble across seeing the green uh, fill light and the green drain light flashing back and forth that's when it's doing that flush and fill uh, to bust up the mineral deposits and the sediment to help it drain more quickly you may never see it do that but you may see it doing that that's what it's doing you'd also hear the drain valve and fill valve opening and closing opening and closing opening and closing the lights tell you nothing's broken we're doing that on purpose um, if you do see the the service light flash I'm sorry come on solid red that simply tells you that uh, it's detected an overcurrent and essentially that means that as soon as it tries to fire up um, it's hitting your 11 and a half or your 16 amp max and that's almost always because um, the canister needs to be replaced the way we get the steam from the steam humidifier to either the ductwork and the steam dispersion tube or the fan pack is with the steam hose uh, we include six feet of industrial steam hose use our steam hose our steam hose has been uh, rinsed and produced by our supplier to not have any residue on the inside remember you're going to be pumping steam through this so if you just go buy some radiator hose that steam is going to rinse out the inside of that hose whatever chemicals were in that hose are going to wind up in the canister you can have some smells you can also get a lot of foaming and that's going to mess up the way the canister operates so don't use somebody else's steam hose use the steam hose that came with it and cut it to length measure twice cut once uh, a lot of problems we see here because the steam hose is cut too short and then you're kinking the hose trying to make it span the distance um, I will tell you in general we just are now coming out of you know the the, the, the heaviest call volume part of humidifier season um, still got humidifier season for another couple months here but you know with the heaviest hardest you know volume of calls we just got through and tech support confirmed another season 90 percent of the installation problems are due to an incorrectly installed steam hose and it's very simple that steam hose as short as it is as that steam runs through it that hose is going to get much more pliable it's very very rigid when it's cold room temperature but as it warms up it gets more flexible so you want to make sure you support that steam hose the number one issue we see with installations are a dip in the run of that steam hose you need a continuous downward slope back to the steam humidifier with no dips the dips are a place to trap the condensate there's always inevitably inevitably going to be a little bit of condensate not a lot but a little even if it's an ounce an hour any dip is going to very quickly fill up 
with that condensate. It's going to get a little puddle there. And that is going to effectively narrow the inner diameter of that hose. The steam is not under any pressure. It's just percolating out like, you know, an open pot boiling spaghetti. But if you narrow that hose, that can start to create some back pressure. And that's when you'll start to get noise happening and weird sounds, weird behaviors. Call tech support. They'll talk to you about the drain hose. They may very well ask you for a picture because sometimes we can see the dip that we're used to looking for. You may not be understanding exactly what we're looking for. We can help you out. Call us when you're on site. We can help you out when you're on site with any of those problems. So now we're finally getting to getting the steam into the HVAC ductwork. So the steam hose, you can see continuous downward pitch. Steam hose terminates in a steam dispersion tube, metal tube with not just holes in the top, but little wells. I'll show you a cross section in a little bit here. So the steam travels into the ductwork, into the steam dispersion tube, and then percolates out through those little wells. Of course, the HVAC blower is also running, so we're moving a lot of air across the top of that steam dispersion tube. So as that steam percolates out, it very quickly gets absorbed by the volume of air being pushed by the blower or pulled by the blower. Um, that's because we can install this on the return or on the supply. Works equally well. Remember, we're introducing the steam as a gas, it's going to get absorbed by the air, so you're not going to have to worry about wetting a filter or anything like that. Inevitably, if you install enough steam humidifiers, you're going to stumble across an application where the steam humidifier just has to be installed higher up than where the steam is being introduced into the ductwork or into the fan pack. Um, there could be an obstruction there like we've drawn, or it could simply be the location that you had available to get electric electricity, a water line and a drain line to the steam humidifier just worked out that it had to be higher up. And so the problem with that is, is that the condensate can't make it back into the steam unit. The, the steam can follow that path just fine. Up, down, around doesn't make any difference. But the condensate obviously can't go back uphill. So in these applications, we would recommend purchasing our drip T assembly. It's a part number 4028, and it's those copper fittings you see there. It's a T and some other fittings to allow you to separate the condensate and the steam. And you're creating a trap and providing a, a, um, a drain with an air gap to drain that condensate away. That can help with, well, obviously we need that because the condensate can't just fill up the tube and then dribble into the ductwork. That would be bad, but it also will help with noise. The steam hose is six feet. Typically, you're going to have your run shorter than that. If you have to go longer than that, do not, do not, do not order a second steam hose. We're so serious about this that if you call us up to say, hey, can I get a part number on a, or a distributor calls up to get a part number on a, a steam hose, we will give you the part number. We'll always ask why. We don't want you to butt two six foot lengths together. What we want you to do instead is to switch over to copper and then insulate that copper pipe. So let's talk about what we're going to do and then why we do that. So let's say for some reason you have to go eight feet. Take your six feet of steam hose, cut a hunk out because that steam hose end is going to fit nicely on the canister and then cut another hunk out because that steam hose is going to fit nicely onto the metal steam dispersion tube. In between those two lengths of steam hose that you just cut, we're going to take a length of one inch copper and braze on either end a one inch to three quarter inch reducer. Slide the hunks of steam hose onto either end, hose clamp, and then wrap insulation around that bare copper. Why do we do this? The steam is going to get the copper 
very, very hot. The insulation is going to keep it hot. And so that is going to drastically reduce how much condensation you get, even over that much longer run. So instead of having to worry about, oh, I've got to run this thing 12 feet and having a lot of condensation, just, you know, you're, you're using electricity to boil the water over and over again because it, it boils and runs up and condenses and boils and runs up and condenses, that copper that's insulated is going to get hot, stay hot, and you're going to get a lot more steam and a lot less condensation. You hopefully have noticed a theme here, that pitch. Sweeping elbows, don't pinch the hose, continuous downward pitch, all those things are gonna give you good, trouble-free performance. Pitch is fairly minimal, two inches per foot when you're using the steam hose, and because copper is you know, smoother on the inside, only a quarter inch per foot when you're using the copper hard pipe. Again, support it. Those plastic J hooks work well. Uh, if you're running it next to a wall, of course, you can attach it to the wall, but maintain that continuous downward pitch with no dips and everything will work very, very well. You may want to mount it onto the ductwork. There's no reason why we say not to do that, but you have to remember, <laughs> excuse me, this steam humidifier is going to be heavy. The unit itself is fairly heavy. You're going to put some water into it. It's also going to get heavy. It's going to start to hold mineral deposits. That's going to make it heavy. Also, there's a fill valve and a drain valve. As these click open, click closed, that noise can be transmitted by the ductwork. So you want to make sure that the ductwork is a thick enough gauge to support the weight and that those clicks aren't going to be picked up by the ductwork because metal ductwork is great at magnifying and conducting sound throughout the house. So it may seem convenient. Certainly you can do it if, if you don't have create any problems by doing that but also worth considering mounting it to a you know drywall or a, a you know a wall stud or particle board or something like that to give you that ability to support the unit without having the um the noise associated with it sorry about that there's a phone ringing in the background we'll just let that go pretend we don't hear it if you are going to mount it onto the ductwork there is a nice option that you should consider. Uh, you can put in a 90 degree elbow or 245s if that's what works for you, um, so that you don't have to have as much height taken up by the nice sloping gooseneck that you would normally have to do with the steam hose. So the, the 90 degree or 245s elbow helps turn that uh, steam without kinking the hose. I would also recommend, um, remember, the steam hose is not under any pressure. So if you're having problems with the steam hose walking its way off of the canister, a lot of guys say the steam is pushing it off. That's not, what, not what's happening. The steam doesn't have any pressure behind it. What typically is happening is, is the, there's too much torque on the steam hose. And so as it gets more pliable, as it gets, you know, steam passing through it gets more pliable, it's simply walking its way off the, the neck of the canister. Easy fix, add a second hose clamp. So one hose clamp at the bottom of the steam hose to hold it to the canister, and a second hose clamp on the steam hose just inside the cabinet to keep it from being able to move upward. Cheap, quick, fail safe. So here's the actual steam hose. It's not a pipe with some holes drilled in the top. It's got those little wells. You can see the cross section drawing there showing the wells actually penetrating into the center of the pipe. What that does is the steam that leaves the steam dispersion tube is coming from the center of the pipe. 
the center of the pipe is going to have the hottest steam because the heat loss is going to occur at the walls, the metal walls of the steam pipe. So your condensation is going to happen around the walls. By drawing the steam from the center, bottom of those wells, the tubelets, you're going to get the driest steam. And um, many of you know that we have a sister company that does commercial humidification called dry steam. That's a technology that uh, we borrowed from them. You don't see that in other companies. That's going to be one more thing to keep you from having any concerns about water in the ductwork. You'll see this absorption distance chart in the installation manual. I want to point out a couple things. Number one, we need a minimum absorption distance downstream of the steam humidifier dispersion tube to make sure that the steam gets absorbed. That minimum absorption distance typically isn't very long, but it's absolutely crucial that that downstream distance, the duct does not change in any way. I don't want the duct to turn. I don't want the duct to get bigger. I don't want the duct to get smaller. I don't want any branches. I don't want a filter. I don't want a damper. I don't want anything in that ductwork that very short absorption distance length. Remember, you can find a place on the supply or the return. Let's go just through a quick example here just so you understand how this chart works, and I'll simplify it for you. So across the top, you've got some conditions. 70 degrees Fahrenheit and 30% relative humidity, 70 degrees Fahrenheit and 45% relative humidity, 65 and 45, and then finally, if you're running this with the air conditioner because you're out in the desert southwest or in Denver, 45 and 45. Let's take a typical example, the second column. Homeowner is gonna maintain 70 degrees Fahrenheit and they're shooting for 45% relative humidity. Okay, so we're gonna use that column. Next is, what's your humidifier output? Well, hopefully you're putting at 240 volts, 16 amps. So you're at 34.6 gallons per day. So that's that lowest row there, 25 to 35 gallons per day. Now you can see there's some numbers there. That is not CFM. The title of that column is airflow velocity. So that's feet per minute. You may not know your feet per minute. Remember, it's not, well, I've got a four ton system, so that's 2000 CFM. We want the feet per minute through the duct. But rather than worry about that, let's just look at the absorption distances. So look at that column and those rows. What's the longest absorption distance? Well, it's 31 inches. Okay, 31 inches, that's just over two and a half feet. And by the way, 300 feet per minute is pretty slow. So that's going to be worst case scenario. Maybe when you're running continuous fan, you're just barely moving hardly any air at all, 300 feet per minute, 31 inches. So rather than calculate this, just go to the worst case scenario. Do I have two and a half feet? You're almost always going to have two and a half feet. Remember, it can be on the return or it can be on the supply. All we need Worst case scenario, 31 inches after the steam dispersion tube with no changes in duct size, no elbows, no branches, no filter, no damper, nothing. If they're keeping the house colder, you can see you go up to three feet, but that's pretty uncommon. I mean, you don't see a lot of people that are shooting for 65 degrees Fahrenheit and 45%, but there's a column there just in case. When you do get into very long lengths is when you're running this with the air conditioner and we don't wanna get condensation. So it's important to then make sure that you've got your absorption distance dialed in. And what I would say is, is probably the easiest thing to do is to bump up your continuous fan speed. So you're into that 600 feet per minute or so range at least. All right, let's talk about the humidistat. There's a picture of the humidistat. If you put in our evaporative humidifiers, you're very familiar with this. The 
Model 60 is the one used with our evaporative humidifiers. The 62 is the one used with the steam humidifiers. Um, the difference is, is the steam humidifier one doesn't have the middle LED to tell you it's time to change the water panel. Because remember, the steam humidifier itself is going to tell you when to change the canister. This is designed to mount on the return duct. So you're going to drill a hole in the ductwork. There's a dome on the back of this control that's going to protrude into the ductwork. So drill that hole. There's a gasket around that dome to give you a good tight seal. Just like installing a thermostat, you're going to shoot two screws in to mount it to the ductwork, and then you're done. We always want to use blower activation on when we're using a steam humidifier. The reason for that is, is we want good, long, continuous run times. If we just run with the furnace and it runs for 10 minutes here and 10 minutes there, all you're going to accomplish is heating the water from room temperature up to very hot water. You're unlikely to get any steam. And so we want, once we get up to boiling, we want to run for a while, you know, run for an hour. That way we get the water up to boiling and we're making steam for a long period of time. And we can get the humidity up to the level we want and maintain it. So blower activation on. The wiring is very simple, very straightforward. Let's take a look at this. I'll just give you the lay of the land. So lower left hand corner, there's your thermostat screw head terminals. To the right of that, those are your furnace grid terminals. So that's already set up. You got R to R, G to G, Y to Y, W to W, because it's obviously the thermostat's controlling the furnace and the air conditioner. We're adding in the humidistat, and you can see the terminals on top there. We're adding in an outside temperature sensor, so we can automatically adjust the relative humidity we're trying to maintain. And there is, of course, is the steam humidifier, so we can tell it when to run. Let's go through the wiring here. So starting at the furnace, because the humidistat is going to be located very close to the furnace, we're not, we're not modifying the wiring between the thermostat and the furnace at all. No changes there. You don't have to pull wires to the thermostat. So at the furnace, we're going to piggyback R to R, C to C, from the furnace to the humidistat. And then W to W. So you've just added in another wire at the furnace at R, C, and W, and wired to those same letter terminals on the humidistat. RCW. You see A and B at the humidistat. We're not using those for anything. We've actually gotten rid of those, so you may start to see humidistats that don't even have the A and B terminals. If you happen to have a humidistat that has the A and B, nothing should be wired there. If you're having problems and you jumpered that out, there's your problem. Take the jumper out. And then let's focus in on the humidistat. You can see on the output section we have two terminals labeled HH. That's going to provide a dry contact. Two wires, two conductor wire, just goes from HH, the humidistat, to the humidifier. We're almost done. All we're left with at the humidistat is a G terminal and a GF terminal. Let's follow those back. If we follow the G terminal back, what that's doing is we're taking the green wire, hopefully, that was going from the thermostat G to the furnace G, and we're disconnecting it from the furnace. So still attached to the thermostat, just disconnecting it from the furnace. And then wire another wire to it so we can get that wire up to the humidistat G. Now the humidistat knows when there's a fan call, but we have to get that fan call back to the furnace. So GF at the humidistat goes back to the G at the furnace. If your humidistat's not working properly, if it's clicking or not working properly, first thing I would say is, Look at your G at your furnace. How many wires you got there? Oh, I got two wires going there. Oh, you didn't wire it right. You can see on the wiring diagram, you should only have one wire there. So make sure you've, you've got that G wired up correctly because that's how we're going to know when the fan is running because the thermostat called for it. But that's also how we're going to be able to have the humidistat make the fan run. That's it. That's it. The hardest part of the whole thing is probably running the outdoor temperature sensor. And that's not that hard. And then here's just the wiring with a little bit of notes to help you see what we're doing. RNC 24 volts, A and B not using, ODT is for the outdoor temperature sensor, 
W is your heat call from the equipment, so it knows when the furnace is running. G from the stat, HH to the steam humidifier, GFF for furnace going to G on the equipment. And remember, dry contact, so no transformer in that HH circuit. That's it. Here's the outside temperature sensor. This comes with the humidistat. You just wire nut whatever length of wire you need to get it from the humidistat to the outside. Put it on the outside of the house. Um, if you have a fresh air intake, you can, you can feed it into that. Just install it as close to the outside as you possibly can. Once you've got that outside temperature sensor wired up, before you hook it up to the humidistat, just ohm it out. Grab your multimeter, ohm it out. See if the temperature it's reading is pretty close to the outside temperature you see on your smartphone. Remember, that smartphone uh, temperature isn't coming from this house. It's coming from, you know, the local middle school or whatever, wherever the weather station is. So as long as it's close, you're fine. Don't mount the sensor on the south side of the house. Don't mount it next to a dryer vent. Don't mount it so low that it gets buried in a snowbank. Those are the things to look out for. If for some reason you don't want to use the outside temperature sensor, don't install it inside the unit. So you take the knob off, pull the faceplate off, you'll see a little tiny switch labeled auto and man. Push that little tiny switch over to manual mode. That then tricks the humidistat into thinking that it's 20 degrees outside. So you'll put the sticker on the humidistat so the consumer knows what to turn the dial to. And you'll know you're in manual mode because you see the little M pop up on the screen. Quickly, I want to cover a couple of variants that we have. We've got modulating versions of these products. So instead of the 800 steam humidifier, we have the 801. This would be uh, for where you want not just to have on-off control, but very, very precise control. Not a typical application, but we do offer it. Uh, if this is something that you're interested in, call your April Air District sales manager or call into tech support and they'd be happy to talk to you about it. Um, because it needs proportional control, you have to use a separate humidistat. Um, we don't include one with it. We offer one, it's a 63, but we don't include one because in most of these applications, there's gonna be some kind of a building control system uh, that's gonna provide that proportional output because of the type of applications you see these used in. But we certainly do offer a modulating humidistat for that purpose as well. Same capacities. And then a modulating version of the fan pack. Let's spend some time talking about the fan pack, the regular fan pack. So you see it there. Basically, it's a register with a cabinet behind it. And inside of that is the steam dispersion block that's going to have the steam coming out of it and a fan mounted inside. The idea here is, is that this is going to be used when you don't have forced air duct work. So maybe you have radiant heat and mini splits. So this gives you a place to introduce the steam into the occupied part of the house separate from the HVAC duct work. Here's a cutaway view so that when the fan is running, you're going to be pulling air in on the one side, the, looking at it the left side, and then that air is going to be pushed out on the right side pulled in on the left, pushed out on the right. And the steam dispersion block that you can see there in that cutaway is where the steam's gonna be percolating out of that oval slot. The air is coming out, pushed down across that steam. And so it absorbs and gets dispersed throughout the house. Works very, very well. Here are just some installation options. And this really depends on if you have the option of installing it before the drywall goes up or if you're installing it after the drywall goes up. The nice thing about the fan pack is that it is narrow enough to sit inside of an interior wall. So you don't sacrifice the other side of that interior wall. And here's gonna be a typical installation. When you order the fan pack, we include the drip tee because we want to separate the condensate from the steam because the fan pack's gonna be in the living space, not on the HVAC ductwork, so noise is a bigger concern. So we get quieter operation by separating those two. 
And again, here's just another idea of what you can do, incorporating the drip tee and the hose and the interior wall. This is the most important slide for the fan pack. Just got a call this morning. We have some very, very easy to achieve clearances. Fan pack, mount it as high up on the wall as you can, but no closer than a foot and a half to the ceiling. Give yourself at least two feet of clearance on either side and nothing in front of it for five feet. Almost every single time that we have problems with fan packs, condensation, humidity not migrating throughout the house, it's because the installer has not selected a location that has these very, very generous clearances, very simple to achieve. High up on the wall, no closer than a foot and a half to the ceiling. So that means don't put it with a shelf above it. Two feet on either side. That means don't jam it into the end of a hallway. Five feet clearance in front of it. That means don't put a table in front of it with a bunch of stuff on the table. Keep, maintain those clearances, you're going to get great absorption, good diffusion, and it's going to humidify the whole house without any problems. Volts times amps equals watts. I'm going to move through this kind of quickly. One thing you want to just be aware of is figuring out how much this unit would cost to operate. It's a good thing to be able to understand so that you and the consumer can have a conversation about it. Now, we don't know how many hours a day it's going to run because that's going to depend. Every single house is different for a lot of reasons. But here's what we do know. Volts times amps equals watts. So that's your 240 volts and 16 amps or whatever it is. Watts divided by 1,000 is kilowatts. And then you figure out what does your utility charge you per kilowatt hour. That's what it's going to cost to operate it for one hour. You know that. That's... That's easy to calculate. Then the variable is, is how many hours does it run? So let's run through an example real quick right before we get done here. 240 volt times 16 amps equals 3,840 watts divided by 1,000. 3.84 kilowatts times 16 pennies equals 61 cents an hour to operate. That's what we know. That's, that's guaranteed. Then how many hours a day does it run? And how many days a month does it run? That's how you figure that out. So is that a lot of money? No, not if you have that as part of the conversation so the consumer knows it. Is that a lot of money? It is if they figure it out when they get that first utility bill. So just, you know, knowledge is power. Thank you very, very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Um, we've got some good cold weather, so hopefully that's keeping you guys busy. Uh, when you quote a furnace, don't forget to discuss the importance of proper humidity in the home as well. I include this slide in every PowerPoint because I think it's important for you guys to know that we all, not just the sales department, manufacturing, every other department, really appreciates you guys choosing April Air. We make our products right here in Wisconsin. Um, these people um, appreciate you guys buying our products. I appreciate you guys buying our products. And we put a lot of pride into the quality of our products. So thank you very, very much for your time.